So I wanted to start off by really talking about what parenting has looked like for us uh, the last three weeks. And it has been um, a juggling act. <laughs> I feel like I have a million balls in the air and um, juggling my work responsibilities, juggling my uh, childcare responsibilities. And then I um, am lucky enough to have very involved teachers who are sending home lots of work for my students, uh, my children to be doing. And so now I'm acting as teacher slash facilitator. So I really feel um, like this GIF represents that for me. Um, I have three kids. Those are the three on the left there. They are eight, six, and four. The young man in the middle there um, is, has some special needs. He has ADHD and um, has been identified as having a developmental delay. So a lot of what I'm gonna talk about tonight really has to do with my experience trying to support him and my other two. Um, one's the oldest is in second grade, my youngest is in pre-K and really talk about the new roles that we all have. So it's a new role as a parent, because now you're taking on a teacher role on top of everything. It's a new role for our kids. Um, and I shared the note that my daughter left on my computer earlier this week that says, to mom, mommy, I've been having a very hard time in quarantine. People have been bossing me around. And the people she's talking about are me. I'm the one who's been bossing her around. So um, I understood. I understood her frustration um, because our relationship typically isn't in the uh, same capacity we're in right now. So I wanted to start off by um, kind of grounding everything I'm talking about in this quote from Robert Slavin that we. Um, we use a lot, I use with pre-service and, and uh, practicing teachers about over-determining success. So um, I kept this quote on my desk when I was an inclusion teacher and it has remained true for me as a parent and it's especially pertinent right now. So when we over-determine success, we're going to anticipate all the ways that children might fail and then plan how each will be prevented or effectively dealt with. So I just wanted to keep that uh, that concept of overdetermining success in mind here. And I wanted to start that off by saying that we have to, as a parent, take care of ourselves first. There's a reason they tell you to put your oxygen mask on first. Um, we need to overdetermine our own success here. So this could be in knowing your own limits um, in terms of your patience for interruptions during the workday. Um, your capacity to both love on your kids and provide that really supportive, loving adult role right now that's really important because this is so new and um, scary for everyone. And then also in that same role, know our capacity to teach our own kids. And then um, really overdetermine your success and know your own relationship with your kids. So my kids, I would die for, but they also drive me absolutely insane. And I can say that because they're my kids. Whereas when I am working one-on-one -on -one with kiddos in a reading clinic center, or I'm assessing a student, or <laughs> I'm working with teachers in the classroom, I have an abundance, an overabundance of patience for uh, kids because I don't have to get them to brush their teeth. Like they're mine for, and they're the teachers for a little bit, and then they get to go home. So we have to overdetermine our success first. And we also have to know that in this very unique time, nothing is going to be perfect. We're not gonna be perfect. They're not gonna be perfect. All of the schoolwork may not get done well or perfectly. Your work may not get perfectly done and it's going to be okay to let things go. So um, I wanted to give us all some permission here um, to just say, we're not, you know, we, a lot of it's been going on with like, we're working from home and we're homeschooling our kids and that's not actually truly capturing what's going on. Um, you and your children are at home, um, staying at home because of a global pandemic and we're trying to work and to school. So, you know, in order to overdetermine our success with that, we have to keep in mind even the amount of anxiety that the situation is putting on us as adults we um you know we're the ones who are watching the news and then we're fielding i got questions today from my second grader um about 
coronavirus. So we're dealing with all of that. So it's not going to be a situation where we're choosing to homeschool and we can devote all of our efforts into it. It's not a situation. I mean, I worked from home quite a bit uh, before the pandemic. And let me tell you, this is very different um, than it was for me when I was working from home by choice. So we all, right at the beginning of March, when things started to ramp up a little bit, you know, I think we all, a lot of us saw this beautiful schedule, right, on um, the one right here on all social media, and it's perfect, and we were all going to do this, and we were going to set out, and our kids were going to go on nature walks, and we were going to teach them for hours at a time, and have this beautiful schedule for everybody and you know it will work if your kid has the capability of working at home in hourly chunks and your only job is to guide them and facilitate them through their learning day but the reality of this schedule is that it can act as a goal an ultimate goal but for a lot of kids for most kids learning at home and not in a school setting is new for a lot of us adults working from home is new, not in an, uh, an office setting or a setting with other people or a social setting or working from home with other people in the house is new. And most especially for high needs kids, um, thinking about my son who um, has some special needs and then the really young children, uh, the schedule is not going to overdetermine success for anyone, right? But it's important to know that schedules do help. So schedules and routines really provide structure and predictability to the day. Our kids go to school and, this, and um, the schools are very structured. They're very predictable. There's a lot of routines and schedules. And even my four-year-old can tell me what her schedule is at her daycare. So um, we all need this kind of structure and predictability in these really uncertain times. And I would... I would submit that um, this is especially important for high needs kids and younger children. And so some things to think about as you're building your schedule are, um, you know, the age, developmental ability, engagement abilities of your children, um, keeping structures and routines where we can, providing them with some choice and incentives, and then especially taking some movement breaks and chunking your schedule into bite-sized pieces that everybody can manage. And when you do come up with a schedule, if you tried and um, tried that beautiful color-coded schedule there on the left and it didn't work, it was a complete disaster, it's important to really think about and evaluate the functions of the behaviors that you're seeing. And you know, Rose spoke about that in the last um, one of these events. And then change the schedule. It's okay to change the schedule. In fact, I encourage you to change the schedule if, if areas of the schedule aren't working for you. So, the uh, footage on the right is actual footage of me during the first week of us being uh, homeschooling and staying at home. So <laughs> the first way we need to overdetermine success is to set reasonable expectations around our schedules. And these are especially for academic or school related tasks or tasks that are going to take a lot of attention and engagement to complete. Otherwise, we're really setting everyone up for failure, right? So we're like, you're gonna spend 30 minutes doing math while I do this 30 minute project for work and it turns into a complete disaster and you look like me there on the right. Um, so I have some loose guidelines that I use that I talk to teachers about when we are designing activities, centers, um, and we're even talking about independent work for kids, um, where the rule of thumb, this very loose rule of thumb, is um, to just take their grade level, and so kindergarten and first grade are about the same, and just add a zero to the end, right? And that would really be the realistic amount of time for sustained attention to independent or academic tasks. Now, your kid may be able to attend for longer times to certain things, and that is awesome, but it's not going to be realistic for most kids for a first grader to sit next to you at the dining room table while you're trying to get work done for more than 10 minutes on a math worksheet. Um, you need to really start small and then build up their capacity and their endurance for this. And I would even say like, I've got a four year old, start at five minutes. So five minute activity of sorting things, five minute activity of coloring, and that's gonna set some, it's gonna over-determine success for them. 
And it's also going to set you up for success so that you understand, okay, I can't reasonably expect them for 45 minutes to sit there without saying the words we all hear, mom, dad, and you're, it's like a broken record by the fifth or sixth time you've heard it. So in terms of setting up a structure and a schedule to your um, school day, you really need to keep in mind that schedules for kids, when you walk into any daycare, any classroom, um, inclusion classroom, special needs classroom, self-contained classroom, general ed classroom, any classroom, there is usually a schedule posted. So you want your schedules to be visual, you want them to be as consistent as possible, and you really want them to be predictable. And my son um, with ADHD, when he walks into his kindergarten classroom, his special ed teacher has put a um, visual schedule on his desk and it's a checklist because that's what works for him. And they fill it in together every morning. So first we're gonna do PE and some days it may be music or art. So that's the one piece that is changing, but it's consistently specials first thing in the morning and then it's snack. And so he can go through and check it off. And I would definitely recommend that. I would say, keeping things, um, some certain things like your wake up and your bedtimes consistent, um, keeping snack times consistent, because I don't know about all of you, but my kids act like they are starving all day long and they will eat. I mean, it's like, mom, mom, I need a snack, I need a snack, I need a snack, all day long. So um, I have built snack times in because that's what they do at school. At school, they can't just graze all day long. And so when you have a dual schedule for your kid at home, like, hey, snack time will be these three times during the day. Try to keep their lunch time the same as, as uh, much as you can. Um, and you know, when you have your kids on weekends and your days are a little less structured, you can kind of fudge it a little bit for two days and then they get back into their routine. But I noticed with my kid last year, my second grader was eating lunch at 10.50 in the morning. And so on Saturdays, she was a hot mess by 11.30. And I was like, what is going on? And then it dawned on me, it's because she is used to eating her meal at 10.50 in the morning. So that's gonna be an adjustment for us as adults as well. Um, think about when your kids can attend to things the best. So for a lot of young kids, when you walk into schools, you'll find them, they do the, um, activities that require the most sustained attention and they need the kids to be fresh uh, first thing in the morning. So in a lot of schools, you'll find first, second, third graders are doing language arts reading first thing in the morning. So if it works for your kids and your schedule, focus on academics at the time of day when you think that they can spend the most amount of time focusing on that. I have a four-year-old who I thought had given up her nap. She's my third child. We don't have time for her to take naps on weekends. We are running, 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 running. But now she's been home with us for 30 weeks. And every day, I've been pushing her through the nap. I didn't even think about it. I'm like, you don't need that nap. But she takes a nap every day at school after lunch, every single day. And you know what? By day eight of this new homeschooling adventure, I was like, why are you falling apart every day at four o'clock? I mean, it was just meltdowns. And finally she said to me, mommy, I need a nap. And I was like, oh my gosh, you do. So as much as you can keep for the younger kids, their rest time, their nap time, consistent with what they're used to, the less of a shock this is gonna be for everyone. And then I highly recommend trying to keep your dinner times um, the same every night for a whole host of reasons. And then I put that little caveat there because I've been doing a lot of reading about adults and how we're gonna keep our own sanity as parents and as working adults. And all of the recommendations are exactly the same as they are for kids. Keep your schedule consistent as much as you can. Keep it predictable, go to bed, wake up, same time every day. So wanted to put that in there. The other thing I wanted to really pull out was that your schedules do not need to be beautiful um, color coded. They don't need, you don't need to have a laminator at home. Um, I have a whiteboard in my house that I've been using. I just write on a whiteboard. It's the easel that the kids were painting with that someone gave us one year. Um, I've also started using for my son, uh, some butcher paper, some packing it's from when we had a move many years ago, some packing paper. And then we just write it on post-its. And he actually likes writing the words lunch, snack, and then we can move it around on post-it notes if we need it. Or you can take anything. You can take a piece of paper and write it in for them every day. But just make sure that it's visual 
and it's consistent as much as possible. And then um, you're gonna wanna provide as much choice as makes sense to really give kids back that sense of control that they've really lost in this. Um, you know, my daughter, when she left me that love note on my computer that I showed you about me bossing her around, it's really because by the time they're in March in their classrooms, they have a lot of independence and they um, are able, you know, the, the teachers have worked with them on the, the structures of the class, the expectations of the class. And so they've lost a lot of the control that they had. They've lost a lot of their social outlet as well and they've lost control. So as much as you can provide some choice, reasonable choice within there, um, choice can be in the order of the school tasks. So every morning you could say, do you wanna do reading, math or science first? So you're kind of forcing choice in there. Do you wanna read this book, this book, or this book today? It can be in their lunchtime. Um, so for my kids, we used to pack lunches at night for them, and now we're packing lunches in the morning with them. And we're also loading their snack boxes with them. And so that's giving them a lot of choice and involvement first thing in the morning that I think is helping them. So it's, you know, do you want peanut butter and jelly? a turkey sandwich or a hot dog for lunch today. Great, let's pack your lunch. You do this, you do this, you do this. So that it's giving them some sense of ownership and also a sense of control in this. And then you can also give them choice in the incentives you provide, right? So um, if you do this, do you want your reward to be riding bikes, having 10 minutes of tablet time, or you know, playing Legos for 10 minutes? And so my son and I, um, have been sitting down and choosing his goals and his incentives. That's something we've been doing for a while now for home behavior and home stuff. So I would start small. He's out to a week now. So on Sunday nights, he picks his goal for the week. But I would just say start with like the morning if this is something new. So what are the incentives that we, what are some things that we can do, some incentives for you to complete these tasks, especially if you're finding that it's a real source of aggravation or frustration or discouragement in your house at the time. Um, the other thing is kids are not, so when I work from home, I can sit in my same chair from eight in the morning until 1230 before I get up and even go to the bathroom. And that is not the reality for kids in schools. Kids in schools are moving constantly. There's always transition. A lot of schools now have moved to like more flexible seating. Um, you, it drives me nuts sometimes because I'm a very orderly person, but when I walk into classrooms, they have kids sitting on the floor, kids walking around, kids up and down and doing all of these things. So um, take breaks build in lots of breaks. And those can really be great antidotes for any building up discouragement, any frustration, get outside when you can, get vitamin D, get some endorphins, build in physical activities. Kids are really physical during the day. They go outside for recess. They're walking in hallways. They're walking between classes. There is a lot of activity built in to um, a lot of their like go noodle and all of these things that the teachers are doing when they get in to get the kids excited. And that's missing when we're like, okay, now sit down and here's your work and you need to sit at the table with me and I've got this hour long thing, so you're gonna have to do this. So I would say as much as you can, build in breaks and manageable chunks of time. And this tweet that came out last week had me rolling on the floor laughing. I don't know if you can see it. It said, if you had asked me what the hardest part of battling a global pandemic would be, I would have never guessed teaching elementary school math. Right, like how humbling has this been for so many of us? My daughter asked me a question about uh, matter that I was like, I have a PhD and I don't know the answer to that. So, um, you know, I think as much as you can go on learning discoveries together and build in these breaks where it's not so serious, and it's okay, that is okay to do. So, the one thing I will say is screen time. This was another tweet that like, it came out pretty early in this on March 13th. And it says, well, I know one piece of medical advice I won't be following in these times. And it is the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines on screen time. So let me tell you, screen time is very useful um, and can be very helpful. And there's two different types of screen time. There's interactive screen time and then there's passive screen time. And they're two different uh, things, right? They're two different concepts. 
So some things to consider, and we're gonna talk a little bit through them right now, um, would be setting some daily limits for your kids. So when we're thinking about interactive screen time, that's gonna be probably more required screen time for school. And that's not the same as passive or entertainment screen time. So I would try as much as you can to limit the passive screen time and your, your limits for both of these should be different. So if your kiddo has to sit on Zoom for an hour to meet with the class, I would not think about that. And many of us as parents, right, we go to the well child visits and they talk to us about screen time and not a lot of time on screens and it's all over Facebook. Um, and so first of all, relax your guidelines for that. And this, this is a very extreme times. But then also think about, you know, I used to have a cold, hard screen time rule and it included all screen time. And so I would say set limits for each of set different limits for interactive or passive. And then think about the behaviors. We're gonna overdetermine success, right? So think about behaviors that are associated with screen time, most especially the passive screen time. My son with ADHD gets hyper fixated. And I mean, I could probably give him a tablet for passive screen time and I would see him 12 days later with a beard and he's only six. Like he can focus in and be gone. And, you know, I've had to actually have talked to him and I could be like, the house is on fire. And, you know, I just don't even see his eyebrows. So when I try to get him off the screen, that's when his behaviors really start to escalate. So I have to really think about what behaviors I see. And when I'm over determining success, I need to think about is, is the passive screen time worth it? And how am I going to set really clear boundaries and expectations on this, especially if I'm going to use it as an incentive? And it's okay to use it as an incentive right now. So when we talk about interactive screen time, even with this, you're going to want to set some really clear expectations. And so examples of interactive screen time could be like online school right now, Zoom. Um, you know, my second grader has a Zoom meeting with other kids in class. I'm setting up some FaceTime with her, with her friends. So she's getting a social outlet, my son as well. Um, they have been assigned some educational games, some learning games that they have to play as part of their academic time. But they're interacting in some way with the screen. And that engagement is purposeful, right? And so as a parent, that is not the same. Interactive screen time is not the same as saying, yes, you can go watch this or you can go play this entertainment game and I have nothing to do with you. You are able to do it on your own. We may have to engage in that, right? So they tend to be supervised learning activities. Even if he gets assigned or she gets assigned something at school, um, some sort of like learning game, a lot of times I get questions when, I, when they're on it. Mom, I need your help with this. Mom, I don't understand this. So it's more interactive between the kid and the screen and then it's interactive with me. So I try to plan interactive screen time around my own work, the interruptions are not going to send me banging my head against the wall. So some of the tasks, and sorry for my colleagues out there who i am now outed myself, I'm answering your emails <laughs> because I can play limited attention to that. And it's not going to, for myself, it's not gonna send me through the roof to have that interrupted. Because there is nothing worse as an adult sitting down to do something and being interrupted 400 times, especially when it's high stakes, it's for your job. So when I'm using interactive screen time, I'm gonna think about things that require minimal amounts of my attention. For passive screen time, you all remember this great BBC interview? This is one of my, this is my life. And many of us who have now been Zooming, um, we have experienced this. So you're gonna wanna set really clear expectations for that ahead of time. And you know, passive screen time is when the kid is, can zone out, it's passive, those are the entertainment games. My kids are really into Roblox right now, so that's what they can go off and do. I use it as an incentive because it's way more fun to do that than it is to do ABC, YA, or whatever the thing is that they're doing right now. So the kid engagement is really high on it, and the parent engagement is super low. Like I said, my son would crawl into a cave with his iPad and be gone forever and come out with a beard. So those are, you know, passive screen time is really valuable as a working from home, um, managing kids, homeschooling adults. So when I know I have a Zoom call with my dean that cannot be interrupted, I am plugging those suckers in in another room and that is that. The expectation is you don't interrupt me during this. 
if, unless you are on fire or bleeding and um, here you go, like this will be 30 minutes. But I do set really clear expectations with them. There are some apps you can put on to iPads that'll count down for them how much time it has. Um, and you'll want to use that for if you have something major due at work that you just know for Friday afternoon, you're going to have to plug in for two hours, then absolutely, this is your parachute. This is your safety parachute, right? Like this is your pull it out when you need it. Try to use it judiciously, but use it when you need it. And it is there. It's your phone a friend. It's all of those great things. And so what does this mean? for us as working adults? Well, everything is now different, right? It's become a game of Tetris. You have to think about their schedule and then you have to think about all the things we talked about and fitting it into your schedule. So things that you can do while they are working next to you that require minimal attention that you have to get done. You know, some of the minutia that may be associated with your job. I have nine to 11 every day now. I just have given into it. I've blocked it off from work stuff. And I just focus on academic activities with my kids because it's the best time of day for us to do it. And that's what works best for us. And then the afternoons get harder with my kids. And that's usually when I'm trying to catch up. If you have a partner in your home who can take over, who may also be working from home, then you know, for me, I get up, I work seven to eight in the morning, I take nine to 11 off so that I can concentrate and focus with them because I think my patient's reserve is low, but I was a teacher. So I have a skill set that my husband does not have as an engineer. So he is best utilized for activities outside, for um, you know, building things and all that stuff. And that's when I focus on pressing things, things that I need to get done. But I've also had to lower my own expectations for myself and what I can get accomplished and do. And I've had to be candid and really honest with my colleagues about when I can meet for these meetings and what I actually think I can put on my plate right now. Um, and you know, there are some times that I've just pushed things to work in late and, and that has not been me for a long time. I do not like working at night, but I have had to push things to working from 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. just to get them done and off my plate. And you really have to know yourself, but you also have to remember that this is an extraordinary experience for all of us right now. So as much as you can to give yourself patience and grace. So, you know, sorry for the earworm because now this is gonna be stuck in your head, um, but I have one, I have a better one in the next slide. Some things to keep in mind, right? Even if your day was a complete disaster and debacle, end your day with that day. Do not bring the negatives forward for your kids. Do not bring your negatives forward for yourself. If you had disruptive behavior from kids or there was just something that you know happened that really threw everyone off, you gotta handle the behavior in the moment and then start with a clean slate for everyone. Learn from that day, change what you can, and then we start anew. And that's what we tell all of the teachers that we work with, our pre-service and our practicing teachers. You know, you cannot say, I'm going to punish you for the next two weeks for something that happened. You deal with the behavior in the moment and then everybody gets a clean slate the next day. Because we also have to keep in mind for our kids that, you know, some of the acting out may be associated with me bossing them around and some of the acting out may be associated with the fact that they're scared and anxious and this is all new and we don't want to penalize them repeatedly and continuously and we also wanna set ourselves up to have a positive day the next day. So ultimately, here's where we land, right? This is Elsa. We need to be more like Elsa. So there is going to be lots of expressions of frustrations from your kids. There's gonna be lots of expressions of frustrations from adults right now. We've gotta let things go. We gotta let the schoolwork go. I get, you know, every morning I have a mini panic attack when I look at what the teacher wants my second grader to do, and then I triage. I think about, okay, what does she actually need to do? I am not kidding when I tell you that yesterday they wanted me to make jello, not happening. And today they wanted me to make homemade Play Doh, not happening. And my daughter was upset about that, but knowing my own limitations, I am not making homemade Play Doh today. So I went ahead and crossed that off our list and I'll teach you science in another day in another way. So um, think about what you can let go for schoolwork, for your own work, and also for your parenting because we are walking these weird boundaries with kids. 
you are not their teacher, you are, are, are not, you know, in this role for the purposes of this evening, for the capacity of this, you are not their teacher. You are a working adult who is now working from home and also trying to teach your children at the same time. So any kind of comparison to your neighbor, to the Facebooks, to everything you see out there, to the beautiful schedules is gonna be your thief of joy and you have to give yourself permission. And I'll end it with the fact that I have a PhD in reading. I teach teachers how to teach reading and I teach um, teachers how to teach. And I have two kids who don't know how to read and I am the perfect person who should teach them how to read right now. And I can't focus on that. I just, I cannot do it. It's just not in my capacity right now to sit down with my kids and teach them to read because of the time of the semester it is for me, because of my workload right now. It would just add way too much to my plate and put way too much pressure on myself that I am making like Elsa and I am letting that go. This is a marathon. This is not a sprint. I have to preserve my energy and my focus. And I also have to work to try to preserve my relationship with my kids. So I just wanted to end it here by saying that we are going to be okay. And you know what? Our kids are gonna be okay. And we are going to get through this. So I have a list of um, resources that I know uh, Genevieve and some other folks at STAR will be able to distribute. One I wanted to point out was that um, Audible, if you didn't know this, is allowing for free listening of children's books right now, children and young adults books. So that is another like safety net. So use that um, when you need it. So that ends <laughs> all of the gifts and my presentation for the evening. Thank you, Gail, so much for those helpful tips and just allowing us to say it's okay if we don't get it done. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So we've had a lot of questions coming in as you're speaking, so we are not going to get to them all, but we will get to them all in the transcript when, I, when we upload that to Facebook later on this week. Um, so I'm just going to pick a few of the ones that I think are really pertinent. So we had a question for families that have multiple children at really different grade levels. How is that manageable? So I would think about um, that um, rule of thumb that I gave you, and I would try to work the schedule with uh, your oldest student who, can, who is likely able to spend more time. I would have that student working on independent tasks while you are attending to um, your younger students who may not be able to focus or sustain their attention as long. Likely, if they're at very different grade levels and some are older, they are used to having more independent tasks that they'll be able to go and do. So even my second grade daughter says, I, you know, this says I have to read for 20 minutes and I'm like, bye. So she goes in another room and reads for 20 minutes and I'm working with the two younger ones. Rose, do you have anything to add to that? No, that was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, so some of the other questions really relate to like letting certain things go. So what if they can only manage one or two things to work on? What should they focus on? So I am here to tell you parents that there is no way that you are going to be able to teach them math, reading, science, social studies, even if the teachers send home all the work for that. So the way that I prioritize in triage is that I know based on a lot of decades of research in the reading field that background knowledge plays the biggest role in reading comprehension. So even if we can decode the words, if we don't have background knowledge, then we're not gonna understand what we're reading. And I like to compare that to if my husband wanted me to read his technical report in engineering, I have a PhD and I'm not gonna understand a word of it. I can say the words, but I don't understand it. So we know from reading research that background knowledge plays a, such an important role. So as much as you can talk to them, um, have them learn about things. My son was on ABC Mouse, that was passive screen time, but he was watching a thing about the Grand Canyon and he told me all about it. And I was like, well, I'm gonna check that box for myself today because you now have background knowledge in that. So I would focus on reading with them reading to them, having them learn about anything that they're interested in, science, social studies, anything in that field, and building that background knowledge and that vocabulary, because the teachers are gonna know when all of the kids go back, God, I hope it's 
in the fall, that there are going to be deficits in the areas where there, you need explicit instruction, right? So decoding um, math skills. But if you can help your kids by building their background knowledge, even if they're Skyping with a scientist or they're learning about Fiona the hippo in the virtual zoo, that is actually going to help them with their reading comprehension later. So if we don't get it all done, we are not setting our kids up for failure. Oh, Lord, no. <laughs> we, it's good to know. Yes, your kids. So I know it feels like an eternity that they're out of school. They're really only missing probably about 10 weeks of school. Now, that is a big chunk of school. I will say that. But when you think about it, there's a lot that goes into those times, right? Like they're in PE. They're doing all of these other recess. They go on field trips. They do all of these other things. So when you really start to add up the time, it's not insurmountable. And the teachers are going to know and account for that. So yes, let go what you can. That's very reassuring. Um, so another question is, how do we teach those non-academic skills, so cooperation, those social emotional skills, when there are no <laughs> other children? So I would say as much as you can model that, and you know, when you're doing your triage, if you feel like, I mean, my kids bicker. So, um, you know, we have a lot of socio-emotional conversations going on right now. And if you need to bail on the math worksheet to sit down and talk to your kids about what patience and understanding is and really model that with each other. I would also say, um, if you're having some sibling back and forth, then I would incentivize and reward when they're helpful with each other. I'd point it out, I'd make a big deal, make it super positive. So my, my oldest daughter helped my four-year-old set the table yesterday, and you would have thought she had like figured out cold fusion by the way that I had reacted to her, but it really helped and built up um, that. I would also say having really honest conversations with your kids about what's going on and talking to them about their emotions and normalizing it. So there's a lot of resources out there for this right now, how to talk to your kids about coronavirus, you know, how to, how to talk to them about anxiety, but also knowing and acknowledging your own anxiety. So I've had a lot of conversations. Actually, I had a conversation with my friend's children on FaceTime the other day because she just was feeling so overwhelmed about, yeah, grownups are feeling scared too, and that's okay, and that's normal. Great. So what do we do if we have a child that constantly interrupts <laughs> all the time? Um, I, I have three of those. Um, again, I would teach that we don't interrupt. I would teach some um, replacement behaviors for interrupting. So in my house, it was kind of loosey goosey on weekends. But now my kids, if they need to say something to me, because now we have to have some law and order in this house, it is raise your hand and then I acknowledge you. So I am going to ignore, a lot of times I ignore the outbursts and then I really reinforce and praise when they do raise their hands or they do, um, my four-year-old doesn't like to raise her hand, so she has a little crown that she puts on her head and I know she has something to tell me. So I, um, as much as you can, I would, I would reinforce when they don't do that. And then I would talk to them about it. You know, after it happens, we have a family meeting like, hey, remember when all three of you started yelling at me about what you wanted for lunch? I couldn't hear any of you. So that didn't happen and we didn't eat lunch. So <laughs> let's talk about that. Rose, do you have anything to add about that? No, I think that that makes a lot of sense of just putting that, ignoring the behavior of all talking over each other and, and trying to teach a skill that's more appropriate and really rewarding that is a really good point. Thanks, Gail. Well, I would also say that a lot of teachers don't stand for that. And so your kids most likely have, even my son with ADHD has that um, skill already learned from school to the point that now he sits on his hands and only raises them because he was doing the like, I'm gonna raise my hands every five second thing too. So I would say find that in your child and, um, and bring that out because they most likely have it. Great, thank you so much. And there are quite a few questions we didn't get to, but I'll follow up with you after the presentation and get Absolutely. them in the transcript. Hey parents out there, you can do this. We're gonna make it through and let it go and cut yourself some slack.